Hello, I'm John with Roadkill Incorporated, where you can sell a MacBook, you can buy a MacBook, you can ask me hardware repair questions, all kinds of stuff. That is all at rdklinc.com. And today I was thinking to myself, um, what old laptop can I do a review on that no one really cares about, that everyone's forgotten about, and that will probably get me, you know, seven or eight YouTube views. And I was digging around in the basement and I think I found it. This is the 14-inch iBook G3. Um, wasn't really that popular of a model, I don't think, based on how many of them I got compared to other uh, models uh, through the recyclers back in the day. Uh, the 12-inch iBook G3, especially the, the 500 megahertz version, was hugely popular. And then the iBook G4 that came after the G3 was, was, was popular as well. But you didn't get too many of these 14-inch iBook G3s. Um, now, you know this is a G3, first of all, because it just says iBook. If it was a G4, it would say iBook G4. So this is just iBook, which means G3. Um, you also can tell because these have sort of a silver and sort of like translucent uh, whitish uh, color scheme going on, whereas G4s and even later, late G3s were more sort of solid beige uh, colored. So anyway, this machine came out in 2002, I believe, and this version has a 700 megahertz G3 processor. Uh, it has a combo drive, which, you know, means you can burn a CD and play a DVD, but you can't burn a DVD. Uh, the combo drive is a uh, tray-loaded drive in this machine, um, not slot-loaded like the G4. And this machine has 200 meg, 256 meg of RAM. Now, the interesting thing about iBooks is that they came with RAM on the board. So this one has 128 on the board and 128 in the slot. Uh, so I'll pull back the keyboard here, these tabs, and this is the airport cable. So if I, wrong screwdriver. So if I remove this uh, trap door here, you will see there's, oh, and I just, <laughs> I just reset the machine by zapping the RAM with the airport cable. So note to self, don't do that. Uh, actually, that's why this is there. So you don't, you don't do that. Uh, let's see. Hopefully I didn't kill the computer. Oh, good. It looks like it's alive. So um, anyway, I was saying um, that uh, it's nice to have RAM on the board because recyclers will go through thousands of laptops and strip out all the RAM, but they can't strip out RAM that's on the board. And if you have RAM on the board, you can power on the machine and see if it's working uh, without adding any RAM. And uh, it's interesting because when the MacBook came out, the MacBook has no RAM on the board. You have to add it into the two slots of the MacBook. Um, and then in 2012 with the Retina, and actually Airs before that, they uh, started putting RAM back on the board, but as of the Airs and the Retinas, there is no expansion. So you can no longer expand the RAM on MacBooks. So Apple has kind of, you know, gone back and forth with their strategies there. Um, so as you saw, it powered up and it took a while for the screen to, to light up. I mean, have, have, since I haven't looked at a machine like this for a long time, I've, I've gotten used to the screen lighting up in two, three seconds. But, you know, this, these old machines, they take 10 seconds before the screen lights up, which is, uh, which is kind of funny. It, 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 it's easy to forget how uh, sort of antiquated these, these machines are in terms of performance and features. Also, imaging this machine, I imaged it, um, well, actually, this, this time I did it through uh, the CD here, but, but previous to that, I did it through a Firewire, uh, dumped an image on it. It took three times longer to image a super-duper image than it does on a modern machine. So this machine has uh, Tiger, no, I'm sorry, this is Panther 10.3 installed on it. I was able to install it through this single CD. One CD has the whole OS, which was uh, pretty surprising. I didn't think it would let me do that. I figured it would ask me for disk two and disk three, and it actually did, but uh, it let me cancel, and then I guess the base system uh, got installed, which is nice. Um, so yeah, this machine would go up to Tiger uh, 10.4, 
I think it came with 10.1, which was, I'm sure that was a pretty awful OS. Uh, 10.3 Panther, I don't think was that great either. 10.4, I think is when, you know, OS 10 really kind of came into its own. It was fully featured. Uh, it was fast. It was lean. It could run on 128 meg, not very well, but it could. Um, so that's, uh, and Tiger's the last OS you could put on this machine. The next OS, uh, Leopard, uh, would run on G4s, but not on G3s. Um, Leopard eh, was kind of a little bit bloated, a little slower. Uh, Apple kind of alternates back and forth between a nice lean OS and then a bloated slow OS. So Leopard was pretty slow and bloated. Uh, Snow Leopard was great. It was an efficiency update, uh, got faster. Um, smaller, and then you know, as as you know, you progress upwards in the OSs, and and there's you know, uh, Lion, and then Mountain Lion, and Sierra, and then High Sierra, and the second version tends to be the the faster, more efficient uh, version of the OS. So these had uh, 45 watt and 65 watt chargers. I think the 14 inch G3 would run on a 45 watt charger. I don't think it had the common situation where the bigger machine needs the bigger charger. Could be wrong about that. It's been a little while. My brain is hurting trying to remember uh, all of the, the differences between these. Um, let's see, wireless. I don't think I've talked about wireless. Um, so these machines have a wireless card that goes right in there. It's a wireless B card. Unfortunately, I couldn't find one. Uh, I dug around, couldn't find one. Um, so the trap door goes in and then the wireless card connects like that and plugs into the airport uh, cable. Um, wireless B was pretty slow and that card in particular was not very good with encryption. So to use that today, you have to basically turn off all your encryption and just have a wide open internet uh, for that card to work. Even in the last couple of years that these were being sold to consumers, uh, that people would commonly call up and say, hey, I can't, I can see the SSID, but I can't join it. And that was because the encryption was too advanced for the card. So um, in terms of repair, uh, these, were, these were problem machines, definitely. Um, the screen hinge, I don't know if you can see, but there's a little bit of a gap here. And this one's actually not bad. Uh, all it takes is a few good yanks to kind of break the hinge, and then you, you'd you always see this, you know, good, like, half-inch gap there. Uh, and once that happens, you know, you pretty much need to replace the screen assembly uh, unless you want to do several hours of work, which I never would want to do. Uh, so that was always a problem. Um, these machines had a lot of screws. The 14 inch G3, it's like they hadn't optimized the design yet. So when you take them apart, there, there are just tons and tons of screws. There's a, the lower casing, there's the lower shielding, then there's the top case, then there's the upper shielding. You can see the part of the shielding right there. What did I do? So a lot of screws, you could tell they didn't really have it together as far as the design. They cleaned that up a lot with the G4s. Um, and why are we asleep? Okay. Um, GPU issues. These machines were notorious for GPU issues. Um, basically, you would, you would get distortion on the screen. You would get lines. You would get flickering. You'd get all kinds of stuff. Um, and that could be resolved temporarily. It's pretty funny. By pressing upward on the left side of the, the, the underside here. And what that would do is it would literally apply pressure to the chip and, and secure all the pin connections of the chip to the board. And so you'd have a really messed up display and suddenly it would, would resolve itself. Um, it, it wasn't a permanent solution, but uh, people tried. People definitely tried. They used heat guns. They used all kinds of crazy stuff. And it was very common to get these machines and they would be kind of wobbly and be like, well, what's going on here? And you would look under here and there would be like a bulge and it would be because someone stuffed some styrofoam or crap, you know, in there just trying to apply that pressure to try and sell the machine and, and get by with, uh, uh, with it hopefully not uh, causing artifacts on the screen. But it never, it, the, the solutions were never any good. The, the machine always started doing it again. Uh, this machine also had 
really horrible inverter cable problems. So the inverter is, is a component that uh, supplies light to the screen and the inverter cable connects from the inverter to the board. And uh, the, the problem was the inverter cable would get crimped. And when that's crimped, well, then the light goes out. Um, the funny thing is in the repair world, the common belief was that the inverter itself uh, was dead and needed to be replaced if you lost your backlight. And maybe on some machines out there, that's the case. But with iBook G3s, that's never the case. If you lose a backlight, if you, if you move the screen back and forth and, and the, the light goes in and out, it was always the inverter, always, always. It was almost kind of the litmus test of whether a tech knew what he was talking about or not. Because uh, if the tech would suggest on an iBook G3 that you needed to replace the inverter, you knew the person had no experience uh, repairing these. So that was kind of interesting. Uh, these have a removable DCN, as do most uh, Apple laptops. The DCN is the component that the AC adapter connector goes into. Um, Removable DCNs are nice. Uh, this one's right here. You screw it in and there's a cable connecting to the underside of the board. They're nice because if the power system gets fried or zapped, you can just replace that uh, or even just disconnect it temporarily and then plug it back in once it's discharged. And you know, you're not, you don't need a new board. A lot of manufacturers, the DCN is, is part of the board. So if, if that gets screwed up, you're replacing a whole board. Um, what else can I tell you? Uh, these machines were actually pretty much prone, uh, or, or you didn't get liquid damage on iBooks. And that's because there's so much shielding. You have this hard case, really tough case, rugged case. And on, on the underside, you have a whole sheet of shielding, metal shielding, aluminum shielding. And then on the top, you've got shielding too. I mean, look at this, even the keyboard is pretty, uh, pretty tough. So you just did not have liquid damage issues the way that you do now with MacBooks. Now, you know, one drop of liquid and, and your machine is toast. Um, so that that's, you know, one benefit of these machines. Uh, one thing too that's cool about iBooks is that the power button has its own distinct connection to the board. Uh, just a simple two wire connection to the board. So you know, it, it, it's pretty foolproof and you just never had uh, power button issues. Now that is different than, than MacBooks. MacBooks, the power uh, button is connected to the keyboard or part of the keyboard. And then the keyboard connects to the board. So the problem with that is you fry your keyboard, you liquid damage your keyboard, and then the power button's not gonna work. Um, so you have all these, you know, hundreds of thousands of people who have a good board, but their machine is not powered on, powering on. And uh, so they assume the whole machine is dead. Of course, Apple tells you you need a logic board at that point, even if it's just a, a fried keyboard. And so that's, that's an issue. And with that situation, what you need to do is go to my website, poweronpads.com. Again, poweronpads.com. If you can't power on a laptop with a power button, um, that shows you where to find the power on pads, which are these two little metal pads that you can trigger with, you know, twe tweezers uh, on the underside of the board, and that will jump the machine so that you can test uh, whether the board is good in a situation where you can't power on uh, with the power button. So anyway, long way around that, uh, that topic. But, uh, but yeah, very nice that it has a distinct power button there. And I think that is all I really wanted to say. Um, yeah, not the greatest machine in the world, but uh, kind of uh, an interesting old dinosaur. Um, yeah, the screen assembly on these, sort of interesting. Uh, four screws, and then the back of the screen assembly just pops off. And the, the structure of the screen assembly is there's a, a very strong metal frame. So it's, it's all based on the screen being mounted in that frame and then the, the back part screwed to the frame. Uh, that differs from how it is now. Now the, the back casing is essentially the shell inside which everything goes. So, you know, different strategy uh, there. I kind of liked this uh, way of doing it because it wasn't that hard to swap out the panel. 
and uh, and also if the the back got totally it was in bad condition you could just pop it off real easily and put on a new one that was nice um, got the battery here got the battery lock the little plastic around the lock always came out uh, got the rubber feet of course they come out uh, apples never really resolve that situation but you take out the feet and then you there's a screw under the foot take that off uh, the lower casing is really tricky to to pull off on these. It's, uh, it takes some experience to get used to. But yeah, there you go. Apple iBook G3 14-inch. So I hope that was an interesting trip down memory lane or something new if you never uh, experienced this computer back in the day. And uh, thank you for watching.